I wish I was 50 years younger you and I'd here. kick your ass. <laughs> My fans can be the harshest critics, you know. And they often are. A wife is often the harshest critic <laughs> of her husband. <laughs> I thought I was invincible. That's what you're, you're trained to believe as a sports person. There was four million people in Ireland who knew much more about managing <laughs> football teams than I did. When it comes to music, I can spoof for the best. Your sporting career is the best time you'll have, and, you know, you have to hang on to it for as long as your life, because everything else is pretty crappy. And this is not like Stephen Rochford has never spoken to Jimmy McGinnis in his life. This is Off the Ball Saturday on News Talk. John's are going with you 3 to 5. You can text us 53106. We're streaming the conversation as well now, so you can listen on News Talk. Watch us on the Off the Ball digital and social channels for Periscope and Twitter at Off the Ball, YouTube, Facebook, and on the OTB Sports app. This is the Saturday panel. Now, last Wednesday, a bit of a shock, Ash Barty quit tennis. 25 years of age, defending Wimbledon champion, defending Australian Open champion, world number one, top player in the world, walks away says she wants to chase other dreams, says she was physically spent, says she had enough for more power to her. She decided to go out at the top. Not always the way. Injuries, selection issues, sports people can retire um, at times not of their choosing. What is it like to retire from something you love? Sometimes the choice is out of the hands of a lot of athletes because of those reasons. And to speak about it over the next hour, delighted to be joined in studio here by Niall O'Toole, Ireland's first world rowing champion, a three-time Olympian. Niall, welcome back. Thanks very much, John, for having me. And what a, what a cool man cave, can you say? Have you been here? Have, have I've you never been here before. I've been in the other studio. It's very it's, American, isn't it? It is. I'm, I'm not joking. Yeah, I just, I just, where's the, where's the beer? Where's the beer? Where's the Yeah, well, we've got non-alcoholic beer we can get charged for. Okay. Uh, also joined at the line on Zoom for anybody watching by Tony O'Gregan, ex-Galway hurler, now a performance psychologist, and Dr. Olivia Hurley, a former Irish sprinter, now assistant professor of psychology at IADT Dunlera, accredited sports psychologist with Sport Ireland and a chartered psychologist. Tony and Olivia, how are you getting on? Hey everyone, very good. Hello everybody, good to be here. Good to talk to you, hope you're all well. Um, just start with you, Tony. Retirement can be so difficult for many sports stars and I've read about your story with the Galway Herders because I suppose you've got a goal, you start off, you want to win all Ireland's, you want to win Leinster titles, you want to be the man with Galway Hurling and you as an amateur dedicate so many hours in your day to this craft. So you're dedicating physical time and mental time and I suppose... Obviously, there's things around it as well that you're doing just to keep, uh, you know, bread on the table. But it does consume you, doesn't it, when you're in it? Yeah, absolutely, John. Usually, it, it becomes part of, of your identity, really. You're spending so much thinking time and so much physical practice time uh, thinking about your performance, thinking about how you can, you know, help the team as a goal with hurler, thinking how you can succeed as a goal with hurler. And uh, you don't really switch off from it a lot when you're in that bubble because it, it is really of high importance for you. You want to achieve at it. It makes you feel very good when you achieve at it. It can have a, a negative effect when you don't achieve at it. So you're, you're putting in a lot of waking hours into how to improve and how to ensure that you perform at your best when those key moments come. How many hours were you dedicating to Galway Senior Hurling when you were playing there at your peak at, in, in the All Ireland Series, Tony? Yeah, I think the, the GPA weren't too far wrong when they said a couple of years ago that players were spending 25, 30 hours a week. And when you factor in travel and you factor in team meetings and you factor in all the video analysis that players do and, you know, the different recovery things they do outside the sessions, you know, it is very close to that mark. So you're talking, you know, a bit more than a part-time job and, uh, you know, it does have a lot of significance for you. Niall, you went to three Olympic Games. You went to Barcelona, Barcelona, um... Uh, Atlanta and Athens was everything that you did in terms of Rowan dominating your life geared around these four year cycles was it that way? Yeah and I guess uh, we talk a lot about balance and, and, and as an athlete and, and part of the problem about transitioning and retiring is that as an athlete you don't have much balance and, and, and I'm afraid to be a really good at anything I'm, I'm afraid balance is is something that you some would argue this maybe as you go into your career you may become more balanced and you have more space and time to, to maybe fill out your life with other things but balance really isn't an option and uh, and that's 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 difficulty when all of that stops um and uh, yeah i think we we talk about balance in lots of you know in lots of different sectors in life but uh, it's something that you really find hard to achieve as a as a, as a full-time athlete and uh, i'm I'm afraid that's 
kind of goes with the territory I'm, af- I'm afraid it's, it's what's required So when you won the Worlds in 1991 how many hours were you putting in back then? Well we were training twice three times a day so it's like it's 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 a full time commitment and um, yeah and again like Tony said and it's 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 a big part of your makeup it's a big part of who you are and your identity I, and how, yeah you're, it's a massive part well it is your identity I mean you develop at a very very early stage as a as, a, as an athlete an avatar if you like and, and that I'm I, a rower yeah I'm a rower and 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 I'm afraid John, that part of that avatar is is closing down other parts of your personality and 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 relationships and so on, and uh, which don't serve you when you transition out. But that avatar is 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 tough, and he has to be tough, because competing at a top level is tough, and it's it's not for everybody, and um, yeah, and 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 you create this persona to survive in this competitive world, and uh, and you become. You can become subsumed by that, that by that persona, and uh, yeah, and it's a huge part of your identity, and uh, and like can be your circle of friends and so much more, you know. Olivia, do you see when you've done uh, classes and I see testimonials uh, from Josh Van der Fleer, Andrew Conway, and the Irish rugby team at the moment? Do you see? Um, a person's identity completely linked to their sport and what they're doing in terms of chasing achievements, chasing experiences, chasing sporting prowess. Yes, it's 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 a very common what I would consider to be a bit of a challenge for me in my role because um, I suppose as an academic, but also as an applied sports psychologist, I'm always trying, as uh, as Tony and I have alluded to there, to try to help them to acquire some kind of balance in their lives um, I've dealt with so many people who when they transition out of sport have really you know had difficulty and um, I think retiring at any age whether you're retiring from sport at 25 or retiring from your job at 65 or 70 um, is a difficult transition so I'm always asking them you know as, as Tony and I have said they're investing so much and, and rightly so in this career that they love and, and I invest so much time in my career but it is about trying to help them to see that that's not the only thing that identifies them. They're not just an athlete. They are, you know, a person who might have, you know, a, a husband or a wife. They're also somebody whose daughter or son, they're, they're friends to different people. So it's really important that they have other things in their lives and even hobbies and, and different things like, you know, their studies. You know, that's one of the things that some of the people who come in and study with us in IADT on the Certificate in Sports Psychology program. It's about helping them to acquire skills and different p- pieces of knowledge and, and, and an education that will stand to them when, not if, when they retire from their sport. And, and also when they get things like when they get sick and when they get injured, because they're things that are going to happen too. And that can put them out for a, a week or two, or it can put them out for a month or two, or it can put them out for a year. Uh, Josh van der Fleer, when he was actually studying with us, acquired that ACL injury and having his studies and having other things to focus on certainly, I know, helped him through that rehabilitation process, but also having great social support around him, having the right physios, the right psychologists, the right, you know, teammates, the right coaches, like that all is really important. So so my, I see my job as helping those athletes to find balance and to be able to see that while it, their sport is a big part of their identity, and for me, it, my career is a big part of my identity. It's not the only thing that is what makes them Olivia or Tony or Niall. Do you feel that has helped Josh van der Fleer then play maybe the best rugby of his life? Well, I'm I, I'm not privy to, to what I know Josh has been working on certainly elements to his game that, you know, he's publicly spoken about certain things that coaches have told him. Um, in the last year or two that he that he should work on and uh, and I certainly know and looking by his performances that he's been very much doing that um, but I think he's also I think when people are happy in their personal lives when they have really good family around them I think you know and he commented you know in Six Nations he just loves the team that he's playing in and playing with I think that makes a big difference to how well somebody performs but I certainly would hope that his his studies in IEDT on the psychology and sports psychology uh, uh, program, the certificate. I know he's spoken about how beneficial it was to learn about some of the things that I would teach them around psychology and mental preparation, but also finding balance and developing resilience for when, not if, when things get challenging and when injuries or illness or the potential of having to retire happens. Tony, you uh, 
were off the Galway panel twice in 2008 and 2013. And now you're in a completely different uh, role in a way as a sports psychologist. Uh, were those experiences uh, almost steps on the road for you to end up in a completely different career to what you were doing? Because you were in accountancy, weren't you, at the time? Yeah, I worked on a, an accountant for about 10 years while I was playing with Galway. And uh, it was during those setbacks, I think I learned an awful lot about myself and that I was too, uh, I suppose, insular and focused in on my sport and career and maybe to the detriment of my relationships outside of it and the detriment of my own career uh, from a professional point of view. So, you know, having that setback at 24, 25 made me realise that, you know, there was bigger things in the world to consider. Uh, you know, I had some really great support around me in my own life with my friends and family, and I had other interests as well. And they helped me to, you know, manage that first setback at 24, 25 and allowed me to, I suppose, rebuild myself uh, to get back on the team, but also more importantly, to have a more balanced outlook when I did come back in the panel at 26. And I would think my, my latter years there for the last two to three years were far more enjoyable when I had that more balanced outlook and didn't put all my self-worth into me, the sportsman and me, the performer, and tying a lot of my happiness and success into that. And, you know, if I played well on the Sunday, I, I felt happy, I felt successful. And if I played poorly, you know, I felt like a loser and I felt like a failure and it affected my mood for a couple of weeks after it. So I think that little setback at 24, 25, it was the biggest thing in my life at the time. But looking back on it, it really helped me to put things in perspective in my life, put things in a bit more balance and it allowed me to enjoy a lot more aspects of life outside of just being the sports person and realising that there's other roles we can have achievement in and other successes in other areas that we can have you know, a real great life satisfaction in. And it's to try and put those things in perspective and in an emphasis on on a weekly and monthly basis for sports people that helps them to detach from that identity that we're so consumed by at times. Is there a grieving process, Tony, initially when you get the news that you don't expect that you have this goal to be an All-Ireland champion, say, for Galway, and then that's just not there the following day? Is there a huge amount of adjustment that you need to go through mentally? Yeah, John, like for me, I wasn't just losing the goal of winning All-Ireland with Galway. I was losing what I thought was a group of friends of 30 or 40 players that for the majority I'd spent nine or ten years with and five or six times a week. And we like we hung around socially together as well an awful lot and that became difficult for me because they were still in the squads they were still uh talking about winning all irelands preparing for winning all irelands and i felt outside that loop for a couple of years so you know at the start there was probably a, a lot of anger and resentment towards the management and maybe the county board around how it was treated and you know that takes a bit of time to to work through and process and then for a while you think maybe I'd be called back if I have good form with the club and you start working towards that objective and then you realise that mightn't happen and then you kind of come to, you know, an acceptance and it took me, I suppose, I think really realistically three or four years before I actually accepted the decision and realised that, you know, that phase of my life is over now and I have to look at the new normal for me and look at other areas of my life that I can achieve in and, and have a good life satisfaction from. And uh, part of that journey for me was starting the course with Olivia back in maybe 2013 when I was still on the squad. Uh, and I found that very helpful to, you know, deal with that transition at the time. And that led me to a transition doing a master's in it. And, you know, subsequently I've been very fortunate to work in that area for the last six or seven years and, you know, spot the signs in athletes when there's an overemphasis in sport and, you know, it's taking away their enjoyment maybe and, and putting too much pressure on them. So, uh, you know, I think the role of, someone like that in setups is really critical to, to help athletes navigate those transitions. This is around the moment, Tony, between the GA and GPA over expenses and this obviously sustainability argument that the GA doesn't want to see naturally players burn out, but then players feel that, well, they obviously want to be compensated adequately if they're training uh, all the time. Do you feel that the GA as an organisation needs to listen to this and listen to the fact that um, it, it seems to be at times when I'm looking at it from the outside in very much about winning and it's about winning these competitions and putting all this money into uh, training teams or preparing teams at the inter-county stage and maybe sometimes there isn't that thought that goes into well we're dealing with players that are amateurs they're not paid and when they're off the panel um, they've got to pick up the pieces because you're walking around in a local community everybody knows who you are yeah, it really, really disappoints me to see this kind of penny pinching around expenses. And, 
you know, for a young player who's, you know, paying car insurance, and I'm not thinking like a 20, 21 year old's car insurance is probably up at two or 3,000 euros. You know, the cost of diesel now and petrol is just through the roof. And, you know, if he's worrying about how am I going to actually get to training on a Tuesday night or, you know, will I be able to pay my monthly car insurance next month? Yet we're expecting to go out and go park in front of 30 or 40,000 people this summer and put on a show for people and, you know, ha have huge revenues for that. I think it's really, really unfair and it's really disappointing that it's even coming to public domain that we have to be having this argument over, you know, maybe what, four to 5,000 euros of travel expenses in the year when you equate monthly to the cost and the cost of living that's there at the moment. And, you know, guys just looking for things around nutrition and, and travel expenses. It's very, very disappointing considering the level of commitment that they're now putting into it and the product that's there, both from hurling, football, camogie, ladies, Gaelic point of view. You know, I think we really got to start working on this a bit better as an organisation and, and reward them for the vast entertainment and the vast joy that they provide to so many people, particularly during COVID and during lockdown when the conversations, let's be honest, we didn't have much else to talk about, only for sport was the one thing keeping a lot of households going and keeping a lot of communities going and making sure there was social connection with people. And I, I think it's it's time that this was dealt with and, and players were backed and supported by the GA. Now for you, was it your body that said time was up? Yeah, I mean you get to that point where, you know, life takes over and, and you you need to you need to grow up and you need to commit more and, and make some make some money. I mean, rowing is not not a a sport that you can make money on and uh, were you making were you getting state support uh, like do they have the grants that they have with nowadays back in the early 90s or when you go into barcelona as a rower were you able to do it full time or did you have to have a job as well uh i was i was full time the grants were a lot less than they are now uh john but uh, i was able to i was able to train full time pretty much most of my career um yeah but th th there comes a point where yeah <laughs> Your recovery goes off a cliff, and and you got new guys, you know, young kids biting at your ten at your years heels. younger. Yeah, ten years younger. You know, they're <laughs> you're in camp with them, and you're you're trying to hide from them, and in certain sessions because they're going to cane you, and you can't you can't re reproduce. You get angry with that. Yeah. Do you, do you get angry? Yeah, you get angry. You get you, you get annoyed, and 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 people always want to take down the guy. You know, you you you've got you're walking around with a big target on your back. So um, and. Yes, you can be cute, or you learn how to recover better. You learn how to to, to 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 supplement your training. You learn how to rest better and stuff like that, and you get cuter. Um, but yeah, I mean, you're, you, there's a target on your back. You're you're getting you, it's 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 much harder to train if you get injured. It takes much harder to to, to recover from, and uh, yeah, so it just it 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 comes to the point where you you have to call it a day. And in our case, in my case, they were moving everything to Cork at the time, John. So so. And that's one of the things, you know. We, you know, you have different stages in your life, and um, and you're lucky if you can keep your career going all through, you know, school, college, job, family. You're lucky if you can do that. Um, um, we everybody moved to Cork back in twenty four. Uh, sorry, in after Athens, and that really kind of killed my career as much as anything else. But it was time to really hang up the oars at that stage, anyway. Would you've noticed then a difference in your body from saying being at Atlanta to Athens eight years? Most definitely, the recovery is you know you can't reproduce reproduce the same sessions all the time, and uh, that's the first thing that really really goes. Your recovery falls off a cliff, as they say, and your power goes. That little bit of explosive power also goes. Um, so that was the uh, yeah in a in a in a power endurance sport like rowing, um, you need you need to be at the top of your game, and that was the that was yeah you feel it going definitely. Do you then have to think? We'll come to more of this after the ads with uh, Niall O'Toole, uh, Olivia Hurley, and Tony O'Gregan. Do you feel then I've got to start planning things now? Yeah, I think and and yeah, listen, you need to have a plan. You, you definitely need to have a plan. It's very very difficult to sit down and and Olivia will will, will probably maybe help me with this, and Tony would help me with this. It was very hard to sit down to a twenty five year old and 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 tell him you need a plan here. You know. You need to think of when is this is all going to end because nobody's going to show up to that conference or have that meeting with you because given a choice to train tomorrow or whether to sit and listen to somebody telling me that I, that my career is going to be over soon soon is is just not going to happen um so having having a plan you need to have a plan you need to have a an exit strategy as early as you possibly can and have those conversations was the conversation happened to you 
No, no. And I think most of the most of the conversation, if you want to talk about athletes, it's a terrible word. I'm trying to find a better word. An athlete is a, a forgive this, this is a brutal word, is a commodity, really. In a, in a high performance system, an athlete is a commodity. And everybody within that bubble is trying to squeeze the performance out of you because it could be a coach who's on a four year pro- contract to the next Olympics or an administration who needs more funding or whatever it is, but you are a commodity that, and that's I'm, I'm, it's a, it's a brutal word. It's the only word I can think of, John, that, that kind of describes that. And uh, most of the things that you meet in that bubble are pointing you to your performance. And most of the things that, um, so, so you're never having these wider discussions, wider plan, what do you think, what, what should you do after sport? And, um, I think Sport Ireland and Olivia might be able to help with this. So I think they are get, are getting better at this. Uh, but it's back to the athletes actually engaging as well. The athletes really need to engage and understand it. And I think it needs to be baked in at a coaching level and uh, right the way through that, right the way through the system really. And uh, to have these conversations really, really early. And again, trying, I said at the start, the balance is, 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 is virtually impossible. Impo- but trying trying to get them thinking about some type of it's something after sport yeah okay we're going to have I need, a, I need to start that earlier yeah we'll talk Tennis after the break with Niall uh, Niall O'Toole here Tony O'Regan and Olivia, Hur- Olivia Hurley on retirement in sport after Ash Barty retired during the week and uh, preparing I suppose uh, athletes to maybe have a look at different things in their life because retirement might not come at a time of their choosing. Off the ball Saturday on News Talk, back after the news. Just, you know, Seamus Power, four up through five holes on Tyrrell Hatton in the last 16 of the World Match Play in Texas. We're back after the news. The Saturday panel on Off the Ball. And this is Off the Ball Saturday on News Talk. John Duggan with you through till five. You can text us 53106, tweet us at Off the Ball. This is part two of the Saturday panel. We're speaking about retirements from sport with the former world champion rower Niall O'Toole, ex Galway hurler Tony O'Gregan, and Dr. Olivia Hurley, sports psychologist. You can listen on News Talk, watch us on the Off the Ball digital and social channels for Periscope on Twitter, at Off the Ball, YouTube, Facebook, and on the OTB Sports app text on 53106. This was kind of inspired, I suppose, by Ash Barty's decision last Wednesday to quit. The top tennis player in the world and women's tennis, 25 years of age, has hung up the racket, as it were. Rory's been in touch. Lots of praise for Barty this week and her decision. Fair okay to her for being so brave. As a huge sports fan, though, I can't help but be sad at not getting to see a brilliant athlete compete anymore, also given such a small window at the top. I wonder, will she look back and regret it? Borg probably did, given his attempted comeback when it was too late. Each of their own was an admirer of elite athletes. I think it's sad, says Rory on 53106. Um, Olivia Hurley, like coping with retirement now that for, say, George Best or Eric Cantona or Ash Barty, they decided to go. A lot of other athletes don't get that decision. Their body breaks down or they're just told you're not wanted. Um, is it a bit of a living death for athletes that don't want to retire? Yeah, there's, there's actually a phrase that we often use in sport um, and it comes from the health psychology literature all about that when people retire from sport and it's kind of more sudden and forced upon them, it, it, it is like Tony has said, a kind of a grieving process that they go through. Um, it's actually something that happens much more often when it's an acute uh, incident where it's, it's, as I say, sudden and they don't have that ability to be able to kind of make the decision on their own. Um, However, I think now we're, we're kind of leaning more towards, a, you know, a kind of a more that this is not inevitable that when you exit sport that you're, you know, going to have to go through this grief process, that there's something called what we, we consider to be like a, a hope theory and a, a cognitive appraisal theory, um, which is for anybody, I don't want to get too academic, but it's basically cognitive is all about how you think about the situation and appraisal is all about how you evaluate the situation and then how you then process that moving forward. So for me, a lot of the conversations that I had and before the break, you were asking about helping athletes to plan for this situation because it is going to happen at some point that they're going to have to, you know, hang up the boots or hang up the spikes or, you know, put the gloves away at some point. So it is about having an exit strategy and, you know, it is a conversation that we need to have with them. And you're right, Sport Ireland are doing quite a lot of work on this with, with young athletes to help them to see that what they've achieved in their sport They've developed great skills and great abilities that, you know, I was interested in Nod said like they're a commodity um, and, and he didn't like that word. And it's a terrible thing to think, but for athletes, that is 
in reality, what a lot of sports organizations and, and maybe even to some degree coaches and managers see them as. Whereas in my role, I see the person first. So they're a person first, they're an athlete second. And it's about trying to help them to develop as, as rounded athletes so that they do have you know that plan and that exit strategy in place for when they retire and using those transferable skills that they've acquired as athletes. Athletes remember, whether they're at the top or whether they're intermediate playing at county level, club level, they develop great skills, concentration skills, great coping skills, great resilience skills, ability to know how to recover and rest and when to be on to be on and when to switch off to switch off. And they're really desirable traits that, you know, um, and skills and abilities that future employers look for. And, you know, people, you know, just generally admire and respect. And they've also developed great as, as your your uh, your person who who commented uh, uh, today on the, on the panel said, they're incredibly brave um, and they do things that really require them to put, you know, their, their bodies on the line. And again, that's a really great thing to have is that ability to be brave because moving forward, they're going to have to be brave in the next phase of their lives. Um, and it is a new normal. It is trying to work out what then works and gives them that buzz after they retire from their sport and move on to another career. And again, that's the kind of the job that I have is helping them to, to see what they have to bring to the table as they move forward into this next phase of their lives. And it is about focusing on what they can do as opposed to always focusing on what they've lost or what they can't do. Um, and, and we're all a bit, you know, kind of guilty of that at times, if, if that's the right word. You know, people who retire at 65, 70, you know, they find their bodies can't do what they used to be able to do. and it is about trying to focus on, well, what can I do? What am I in control of? And working forward with with that kind of perspective um, is really important, you know? So it's, it's yeah. their, their life skills and, you know, it's how we we, we see, help the athletes to see that they're, they're, a, they're a very valuable commodity after they've <laughs> retired from sport as well. Uh, Olivia, I'm interested in the adoration of the crowd. You hear athletes talk about that it'll never be the same. It'll never be as, uh, I'll never get such a high as playing in front of a, a crowd at Anfield or Viva Stadium or wherever it might be or winning a world rowing gold or playing for Galway. Is there actually a chemical aspect to this? I'm wondering, like, do serotonin levels, for example, decrease when suddenly you wake up one day, it's all gone? Yeah, it's, it's it's really important that athletes, again, that's something that I'm, I'm as I say, first and foremost, a scientist. So I love, you know, the whole explaining to the athletes how their brains are working um, and things like their serotonin, their dopamine, you know, their oxytocin, their adrenaline, all of those things are, you know, you know, at, at a very high level when they're running out in front of, you know, 80,000 people. Um, and yes, there is, you know, something to be said for that that dips away. It actually dips away with age anyway, John. So when we actually are in that heightened stage of our careers, maybe in sport, you know, that kind of mid-teens to into your 30s, that's when all of those chemicals in your body, for want of a better phrase, your brain is creating and, and kind of secreting a lot more of them. And, and the funny thing that I tell my students and my young athletes is, you know, enjoy your time in sport when you're a teenager and when you're in your early 20s, because nothing feels as good after when you've moved on, because your brain and body is designed to be in a very uh, sensitized safe state to those chemicals when you're young and when you get older the the receptors and the way that the body and the brain work is not as sensitive to those so it actually happens naturally part of the aging process anyway but there are ways that we can help to boost our levels and um, even as we get older and um, and things like finding ways to um you know i always encourage athletes and older you know people you know still be a part of your community still find your purpose in life. Volunteering actually is something that we would always say to young athletes and to, and to older athletes and to people in general, we get a boost of oxytocin when we help somebody. So volunteering in our community and finding ways to have purpose as we age and as we go through the, the kind of the life transition is really important because, you know, that is what helps us to, to maintain that feel good factor and to some degree create the buzz that we've had in the early part of our lives. But it's part of the aging process that nothing feels as good as it does really because of the heightened levels of oxytocin, serotonin, and dopamine and, and, and all of that stuff, you know, in our early part of our lives. So, so it's just yeah. unfortunate, but it is what it is. Uh, so Tony, when you were no longer involved with the Galway Hurlers uh, at still a relatively young age for an inter-county player, 
what was you missed most or what was what was bugging at you what was gnawing away at you was it the fact that you're, you wouldn't have that buzz anymore of playing in front of a large crowd or was it the uh, the prospect of achieving things what, what, what were the things that were disappointing to you I suppose yeah, it's probably the, the small things that really trigger it, John. It's the, the Tuesday night in the dressing room prior to a big game and just the crack in the conversation. It's the small conversations after the breakfast or after lunch and you're heading off to Crow Park for that big throw-in at 2 o'clock or 4 o'clock. Uh, and that buzz of butterflies, mix of nerves, mix of excitement and everyone trying to manage that and cope with that as best they can and supporting each other around it. And you know, that rush of adrenaline coming out the tunnel on an All-Ireland final day and, and 82,000 people there and every cell of your body just completely alive with that experience and the ground shaking underneath you and, uh, you know, after a couple of minutes you're settling down and trying to get into the warm-up and into the routine of it and, you know, those big moments on the field when a teammate has a big player, you have a big player, the final whistle when we're all in the dressing room having, you know, worked awful hard for months on end to achieve a goal. It's all those little moments I think you'll reflect back on and, and, and miss. But also, uh, I have a huge amount of pride to say that I was a very fortunate person to experience that too. Um, you know, there's probably only one or two percent of GA players that actually play county level and, you know, even go on further to play in all Ireland finals. So I feel I'm very lucky to be part of that experience and, and had it. And uh you know, I would think a lot of people who take up sport would have loved to have been down that experience and loved to have had that either at county or professional level. And, uh, you know, it's it's nothing but gratitude for me for been through that at this stage. Uh, and it wasn't maybe always the case, but when, when you can look back with experience and say that situation in my life was something that was actually brilliant for me. And I learned an awful lot about myself and about other people. And, uh, you know, it just was, it was a magical time in my life looking back. Niall, did you find the transition easy in terms of your mood, in terms of not having that buzz again? Yeah, it's, 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 again, um, you have a huge amount of structure and rhythms and routines. And when you, you take all of that away and, um, and, and the life outside of sport is kind of complicated and a little bit icky and it's kind of, it's hard to adjust to kind of a new norm. Uh, people, give you a pass as an elite athlete, you know, kind of well, obviously that's that's the way he is. But when you're not an elite athlete, um, you know, you um you can't behave the same way. Um, you know, it's 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 a pass for what? So so again you can you, you could you could <laughs> so for instance if you if you're not if you don't go out for points, okay. <laughs> You can say no for for five, six, seven years, whatever. No, everybody said that's what an elite athlete does. But if you're kind of, if you are, if you have a, a, a friendship and, and a network of people that you um, you, you you should socialise with, you and it's good for you to socialise with them. Um, if you if you keep saying no to people, that is not a particularly good thing. Uh, it's not a good thing. You know, it, it's you learn a lot from sport and. Olivia alluded to that, all the things that you learn, but some of the things aren't particularly good that you that you that you bring and, and start to depart. A lot because of se- it's selfishness. a lot of selfishness, yeah, and relationships and stuff like that and just just not being in, just generally not caring about anything else other than going fast and doing things to make you going fast. And that's and, and, and so when you and, get off the treadmill, what's it like then and, for and, the first couple of years? <laughs> well, it is. It you really, really need to adjust. You need to lean into all your relationships a bit more. Uh, you need to be aware of. Um, you can't get away with the same level of kind of aloofness. Uh, you can, certainly can't be as selfish as you were in the past, um, or else you're going to take a hit. Um, Tony was t- talking about that. That, but but the transition is is is. I always thought sports people are more like drug addicts than bankers, if that makes <laughs> sense to you. We're addicted to progress. We're addicted to um, to this adrenaline, to this rush all the time. Again, as Olivia said, we have huge amounts of dopamine running around your body, and you know you, you get all of these highs all the time. And uh, when that goes, and unfortunately, and I, I know a lot of athletes who have replaced the addiction of that with other addictions negative and, supports yeah clearly and that's that's a that's it, that is a that is that, that is a problem and uh, 
out there with retiring athletes is 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 that void is filled um to get the high the thing yeah so that's a, that's that that's 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 a problem um but again yeah you miss you, you, you again you miss it all you, 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 you miss everything life is very very simple as an athlete and it becomes very very difficult when you realize that all of the all of that support structures all of those things that you leaned on over years is, is gone and um listen we don't uh, like it's a great life there's no question about it um i've gained but it's finite amount. but it's finite and again we we need to we need why is it important why are we having this conversation it's it's really really important that we have a- athletes exiting the sport in a good state of mind we don't want a situation where athletes are leaving the sport you know uh, screwing up their lives screwing up their relationships not giving back to the sport that they they could be involved in and and give something back and support the sport and support the athletes we need good role models who are leaving the sport balanced who can take who, who are seeing that there is life after sport so we need structures that it's, it's really really important that that we acknowledge that there is a problem and um and it's really, really important that our athletes leave the sport and then they're in good nick because they have a lot to give to society and they have a lot to give to the next generation coming through. Plus, you're still involved in rowing. Well, I have a business, yeah, a rowing business. So, yeah, I'm still involved in rowing, yeah. So it's, uh, it's yeah, which is great. I mean, if you can, again, and back to what Olivia said, you, you, there's a lot of things that you learn, resilience, toughness, the ability to, 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 to deal with difficult situations, the ability to pick yourself up and go again, the discipline, all of that stuff. When you're in that bubble, Johnny, everybody's the same. Everybody has those baked in abilities, all those baked in disciplines and stuff like that. And everybody seems the same. But you have to realise that when you go outside that, that bubble, you are exceptional. And and it's about the, learning how to deploy those skills across other games in life and that game could be in relationships it could be in a new business it could be loads of things there's loads of games to play when you've finished your sport and you've loads of skills to help you play those games better than most people so it's really really important that uh, you recognize them and it's virtually impossible to recognize them when you're in the bubble because everybody has them and everybody has those skills. We're speaking to Niall O'Toole here, uh, Tony O'Regan and Olivia Hurley about retirement from sport. Have you seen in your field of work, Olivia, people replacing the high of being a top sports star with negative supports, as Niall was touching upon there? Yeah, John, I have actually, and I'm delighted that Niall mentioned it because it is one of the, it, it, it is definitely, as he said, we want our athletes to be exiting in a, in a good frame of mind. And one of the things that we do do is, um, and certainly I encourage the athletes that I work with, you know, they might not listen to you as a psychologist, they might not listen to the coach, they might not listen to, you know, the, the, the parent or the, you know, the friend outside of sport, but they have idols and role models within their own sport who have exited and that they admire and respect good people. As I say, you know, always, you know, seek out and hunt out who are the nice people, the people who really have your back. So I always try to kind of, for want of a better phrase, buddy them up. So putting like a young athlete with an older athlete and having that older athlete who's maybe just retired or has gone through the retirement process, really kind of mentor, if you like, if they're willing to do that, the young athlete, because they'll often listen to that person even more than they listen to, as I say, a psychologist, a parent, a lecturer, who's telling them that they need to have these kind of exit strategies and and, and have these brave, sometimes difficult planning uh, conversations. Otherwise, they are kind of, they, they, they kind of, you know, when they retire, it's like they are in an abyss. They just, as, as Niall said, they, they strive to achieve these buzzes through other means and, you know, alcoholism and, you know, engaging in, in other kind of behaviors, gambling, et cetera, where they're trying to get these buzzes that they miss and some sort of routine and structure and you know all of those things are gone so they they kind of lean into the things that you know we don't want them to be leaning into the kind of unhealthy things and um, but i think it's great that we have brilliant people like richie sadlier and david gillick and you know some people that i've had in, in the program who've come in and spoken as guests but have also graduated from from the certificate in sports psychology who are willing to now talk about their difficulties and give these young people who are you know impressionable really good advice and really good supports and and kind of help as they as they kind of 
prepare and, and enjoy their careers while they have them. I mean, we don't, we're not asking them to deviate from their careers and not enjoy them. Enjoy them while you're doing it and when your body is healthy and well and in a good place. But also know that that's not going to last forever, and there has to be a, a, a kind of a, a plan as you as you move forward with your life, like you would in any plan, you know, or any life. It's it's like what's the five year plan? What's the ten year plan? I ask them that all the time, you know, and they sh and they're very good at planning, so they can really use those skills, you know, and they shouldn't see it as a threat either. Sometimes when you have these conversations, they see it as you know, I don't want to think about that. That's a threat to my current performance levels and, and it nearly they feel like it distracts them it doesn't it actually helps to armor them so that they can actually go forward and enjoy performing when they're performing but also have other things in their life and other things that they're helping to what we call you know protect their futures and um, as 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 they're going through that career as well so it is about helping them to, to kind of see that Bridgie Sadlier's book, by the way, folks, is excellent. Uh, I've read it recently. It's definitely worth a read if you're a soccer fan or for, for, for this kind of subject about early retirement. Tony, can sporting bodies do more to break the fall? Yeah, and I think you look across any institute, be it Australia, New Zealand, America, UK, Ireland, you know, there definitely is shortfalls there around how we manage that transition afterwards and the recognition of an athlete's career and you know, we're, we're mighty for pumping in support from there, be it nutritionists or psychologists or S&C coaches or, or their own coaches while they're performing. But then I don't think there's a great plan of how we're going to help them for the three or six months afterwards. And, you know, the check in phone calls to see what their life plan is and how that's developing and whether they've gone back into coaching, what their next step is in their career, you know, what their support network is, what what's things that are you know, affecting their mental health, what are things that are affecting their life satisfaction. And I think there's definitely roles for people and bodies to, to do that better. And I think it would really help with, you know, bringing a lot more people through the journey in a, in a more efficient way, in a more helpful way. And you out of that, you would probably get a lot more coaches that would go back into it. You get a lot more mentors mm -hmm. uh, to younger athletes. And, and the conversation would be a lot more around not just an end, but a start of something new as well and a start of the next journey and the next chapter of your life. And uh, I think that could be found in all those organisations that, that it definitely can be done a lot better. You've got a career now in performance psychology, uh, Tony. What <laughs> advice would you give to yourself uh, now if you could kind of go back to, say, when you when you, when you you got those letters from, from Galway about retirement and that you're not being on the panel? What, what are the do's and don'ts, as it were, for anybody who has to maybe give up the sport they love uh, for reasons beyond their control? Yeah, um, I think the big thing that I would have discovered is that uh, you have to lean into people that are there in your own family, in your own friendships for support, because it isn't easy. You've been conditioned to, to do this thing you love for nine or 10 years. And uh, it's not just you can turn off the switch to that. Uh, so I think your support network around you is absolutely vital to help you navigate this moment. And, you know, it's not all doom and gloom there's definitely disappointing days and, and, a, and a low mood around it at different times when you when you think of it in a certain context but you know it can absolutely open up a, a lot of opportunity for you as well and uh you know it's to have the right supports around you to recognize those opportunities and as Niall said and olivia that you have a huge amount of skill sets now that you can apply to the game of life be it in a business context be it in your relationships or even maybe in sport in a different avenue. And uh, it's to have these conversations will allow you to actually access those potential opportunities for you and access those strengths that maybe you don't see at the moment or are invisible to you. And from there, that gives you a lot of empowerment to you know move forward and put your energy and attention into the next phase of where you'll achieve success for you and what success looks like for you. And that's a really important thing to note. What are you working at now? Are you working with any teams at the moment, Tony? Yeah, I just uh, last month I would have just finished at Bally Gunner for, for the season after winning the All-Ireland Club. So that was a, a great journey and I know the lads will be getting back into in the next couple of weeks and uh, working with the Offaly Hurlers at the moment who have a really important game in, in about half an hour against uh, Antrim. So um, they're, they're the two main ones at the moment, John, for me from a sports context. Bally Gunner, put that on the CV, Tony. <laughs> yeah, a phenomenal, phenomenal experience. No Harry so Ruddle, you were there. Were you there at Croke Park in the day? Yeah, I think uh, Harry's uh, had, had a good four or five weeks after that game, more than most of the lads. And, uh, you know, it was a great end to, you know, a brilliant All-Ireland journey for the lads. And, uh, 
you know, it's just been a phenomenal couple of weeks for them celebrating that and enjoying that achievement. And, you know, they've created a great bit of history for the club and for the county. One thing about it is they didn't give up, even in the very last play. Yeah, and I think that's uh, a huge emphasis by the management and coaches to, you know, stick to their process and game plan around that. And uh, it's great to see lads with 30 seconds of play, not really playing the clock, just playing what they've been trained to do and, you know, playing with that composure and that level of control and, you know, seeking out those opportunities and then having the skill set to, you know, execute it. And uh, it definitely heightened the whole emotion of winning uh, to, to snap it from maybe a, a situation where defeat was possible and likely. What did it do for the community down there? Uh, it was just absolutely electric to see, uh, you know, people in their... Uh, very early years, one and two years of age, up to you know people in wheelchairs who were suffering from illness and, and the impact it had on the whole community and just the whole positive emotion leading into it and afterwards and you know I think it's it's a great thing for any community to experience and uh, you know it's been really transformational I think for the whole club and community down there. How are you feeling about Galway this year with Henry? I think they've built a nice squad over the course of the league. He's introduced four or five younger players and, you know, I think Ronan Glenn and Keenan Fahey, you know, Darren Morrissey, likes of these guys have got, John Fleming have got great game experience. So I think he's built a nice panel there of 2025 players and, you know, I'd expect him to have a really good tilt at, at the Leinster Championship and hopefully progress as one of the three sides out of that. And after that, then you're, you're looking at an All-Ireland series and, uh, it's all on the day regarding performance from there on in. Now, were you buzzed about what happened to the Olympics with rowing because we had Paula Donovan and Fintan McCarthy win gold for Ireland in the lightweight double skulls and then Emer Lamb, Afrik Kyo, Fiona Marcia and Emily Hegarty, women's four got bronze. Yes, every time I hear it talk about <laughs> the Olympics and rowing, a big grin comes over my face. It's just fantastic. Um, so, yeah, it's, 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 it's again... A great system. Really, really pleased for the girls. Actually, I mean, we have a a, a really a, a a bubble in in Skibbereen that was churning out athletes there for a very long time. But the the women's four is very much a system boat, which means the system is 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 and those girls are from all over the country. So that's a really really positive positive um, uh, aspect of, of of the Olympic Games. We're in a situation. It looks like I don't want to quote anybody. It looks like we this might be the last Olympics for lightweight rowing. So the double uh, uh, will will finish. The lightweight double will finish. Uh, th- nobody jump all over me, but that's where it's looking. So si- like having uh, having a really strong women's uh, team and uh, squad is going to be really really critical. And I think from a from a rowing Ireland's point of view, we're going to have to pivot more towards women's rowing heavyweight men's rowing but especially women's rowing we have a good squad of girls there and uh, just can't wait for Paris I'm going to go over and just can't wait for it and hopefully we'll get another two or three medals and hopefully the coverage that we don't want us to just see every four years and we're guilty of it as much as everybody else look it's not soccer it's not rugby it's not gated games yeah. but it is an elite performance sport that is delivering Yes, it is, and we we need to really get behind them. And and I'm going to be over in. I'm going to. I'm definitely going to go to the world uh, Europeans and worlds this year. So I might dial in and and give you guys so physically call. demanding as well. That's one thing I think. Like the demands on the O'Donovans or yeah, it's, it's, McCarthy it's, or it's it is it is pretty brutal. I have to say, and uh, the coaching, the Italian coaching structure is is <laughs> the sessions that they're doing is is. <laughs> It's, they're so they're so difficult. I mean, they're so difficult. They're living in 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 Cork, um, and uh, you know they 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 don't have much like they're living out in the in out in the sticks in Cork, and uh, they don't get to see or do much else other than train, and it's a very very difficult lifestyle. And uh, and again, it's not for everybody. It's uh, but they they've got a great team. They're training really really hard. Uh, we people should kind of get behind them a little bit more. The media should get behind them a little bit more, if that's okay, if I can say that, John. And uh, send some cameras, send some, do some interviews, go down there and see what they're doing because it's pretty pretty phenomenal. If you think, I think we were third, third or fourth or something on the, on, on the Olympics um, in terms of medals from all the other, all the other nations uh, ahead of the Brits, 
ahead of the Canadians, ahead of the Australian, whatever. We were ahead of some serious nations, the yeah. USA. So we're ahead of some serious nations. So we're punching above our weight, really are. And uh, long may it last. And uh, yeah, roll on, roll on Paris. And Olivia, just to finish, I suppose the learning of this conversation is that for anybody out there who's facing retirement in sport, um, there is help out there. There is psychology. There are people who've gone through it who can help that if you speak to them. And it's not maybe uh, where it was a few decades ago where it was just you're gone and that's it and you just have to just deal with the void. There is a support structure there and it's just a case of accessing that. Absolutely, John. Yeah. And I think uh, both uh, Tony and I have alluded to that already in that, you know, there there's life after sport, but and it isn't just there's life after sport. There's really good life after sport. You know, it can be really exciting and really, you know, a time of great kind of, you know, hope and joy and where you can really, you know, develop a new exciting kind of future for yourself where you, you get great satisfaction out of achieving things that you never thought you would have achieved um, and wouldn't have had time to achieve when you were doing your sport, you know. So, uh, I, yeah, I think they, the message just needs to be kind of keep, you know, keep going and keep just remembering that there are supports, but also that it, it is a good life. It's not just life. It's a good life. And, uh, and, and, you know, we, we, can, we can help them to, to find what, what can make it as exciting and as adventurous and as joy-filled and as hopeful moving forward for them as is possible. Um, and as Niall said, they are exceptional people. You know, athletes by their very nature are incredibly brave at what they've done in their careers as sports people. And, uh, and we should really applaud that. And we should support them as much as we can when they're playing sport. But we should also really invest in supporting them um, when they're transitioning out and exiting from sport. We, we owe them nothing less than that. Dr. Olivia Hurley, Tony O'Regan, thanks for coming on the Saturday panel. Thank you. And Niall O'Toole, thank you for coming in. Thanks, John. Thanks a lot. Pleasure. Enjoy the rest of your weekend, folks. Chat soon. This is Off the Ball Saturday on News Talk. Seamus Power going great guns in the golf. He's well up on uh, Tyrrell Hatton. And also, we're going to bring you My Racing Moment after the break. Willie Mullins, the feature interviewee, before Football Saturday, building up to Ireland against Belgium between three and five. Don't go away.